Hello everyone, welcome to yet another video in this The Clown Decade, the decade where things are only going to get worse before they get better. And while the Tories have made a huge mistake by getting the Culture Secretary to send a little letter to Rumble saying please stop letting Russell Brand make money on your platform, they have been quite good on the environmental fronts this week and they get my approval. So this will be a purely white pilling video even though there's plenty of black pills to take when it comes to Tory behaviour. So Rishi Sunak gambles on cutting back net zero plans. PM relaxes rules on petrol cars, gas boilers to spare families unacceptable costs. Yes, these are problems that I have been talking about for years. Rishi Sunak pledged that he would not impose unacceptable costs on households to hit government's net zero targets as he scaled back green policies. Thank the Lord. The Prime Minister said that in the past politicians have not been honest with the public about the cost of net zero and warned that they were in danger of losing the consent of voters and provoking an anti-green backlash. Now that is absolutely true. Pretty much every Tory voter and member I know knows that net zero and all the green policy is effectively a scam. That's just going to end up costing the ordinary people an awful lot of money for not an awful lot of good. You maybe might save 0.1 degrees on the average temperatures around the globe. Sunak used a Downing Street news conference to announce that the ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars will be pushed back from 2030 to 2035. He also exempted a fifth of households from the plan to phase out the sale of new gas boilers from 2035. Sunak said that 5 million homes in which moving to heat pumps would be disproportionately expensive would never ever have to switch from gas. Subsidies for people replacing gas boilers with heat pumps would increase, however, from 5,000 to 7,500. Which, of course, it is pointing out that subsidies all come from the taxpayer anyway. And now we may as well go into a bit of detail on this petrol and diesel car plan and this heat pump plan. So first it's worth pointing out that electric car sales switch into reverse and the cost and lack of charging networks have deterred drivers. In other words, people are not really going for electric vehicles because, as Rishi Sunak has pointed out, they are incredibly expensive. Hopes for the mainstream adoption of electric cars has been punctured by figures revealing a fall of more than 11% in the sale of zero emission vehicles to private buyers. The Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders has said that motorists are holding back from the switch because of continued uncertainty about whether a government ban on petrol and diesel cars will be enforced, the culture of electrical vehicles, the cutting of financial incentives and fears about the lack of public recharging networks. Ministers in the industry have previously hailed rising sales of electric cars as a sign that Britain is ready to move from the early adopter stage of battery electric vehicles ownership to mass market. However, the number of electric vehicles bought by private owners has fallen from more than one in three of the BEV market to less than one in four in just one year. Figures for the first half of the year shows a 32% surge in BEV sales to 152,000 cars, accounting for a sixth of all new registrations, yet detailed data reveals that private motorists have stopped buying. And I would not be surprised as well if resale of electric vehicles is quite high because people will buy them and then realise, oh hang on, this is actually very expensive, I need to go back to petrol cars because they are cheaper to run. I have a few anecdotes of people who have done that. The vast majority of new BEV registrations this year, more than 75%, were with fleets and business owners who will take advantage of company car tax breaks, the benefits in kind regime and salary sacrifice schemes that mean running an electric car attracts dramatically less tax. In the first half of the year, 37,000 new electric vehicles were registered to private retail buying motorists, or just 24.2% of all BEVs. That is down from 41,800 BEVs sold to private motorists in the first half of last year, when retail buyers accounted for 36.3% of all electric vehicles. So yes, as it turns out, the electric vehicle market is mainly there as a tax avoidance scheme for businesses. How many of those electric vehicles will end up being used rather than just being invested in by businesses to avoid taxes? It's quite hard to say. But obviously we need to wait and see how these trends continue. Will less and less people buy electric vehicles? Or now there is a pushback with the ban of petrol and diesel cars, will we actually see those type of cars be purchase more. Now onto the heat pump thing. According to Octopus Energy, they have a useful little table here comparing gas boiler figures to heat pumps. So let's assume that your average heat demand for the year is just under 10,000 kilowatt hours. The efficiency of a gas boiler compared to a heat pump is 82.5% to 300% efficiency. And if you're wondering how 
in energy efficiency manages to be more than 100%. They are actually just using a little trick where all they are taking into account is the electricity actually put into the system compared to the heat put out because using a heat pump they take heat from the air outside and bring it in and because they are using clever refrigerants and a system of expanding and compressing the gases it actually does work and compared to the electricity put in you're getting a hell of a lot more heat out of the system so that actually does all that up and with the annual energy use comparing from 11,700 kilowatt hours to 3,218 kilowatt hours you can see that you're using a lot less energy. However, because gas boilers are using gas and gas is a lot cheaper to supply than electricity with eight pence per kilowatt hour compared to 30 pence per kilowatt hour, we can see that in the end, the annual bill for heat pumps is ever so slightly more than gas boilers, coming in at about a 30 pound difference. So you may be wondering, well, how does this actually save me money by buying a heat pump? which is a claim you will constantly hear from people who say, oh, you save money with heat pumps. Well, Octopus have another table comparing gas boilers to heat pumps, saying, what do you save if you're on a smart tariff, which is a electricity tariff that will only actually charge you the daily surcharge for between certain hours of the day where you're actually using the most electricity to power the heat pump. And they also say why well, you won't be charged gas anymore because you don't have gas going into your house so we can just get rid of that daily surcharge completely and this apparently ends up saving you 201 pounds and 85 pence and obviously you take the 30 pound off it comes to about a saving of 170 pounds a year which if you take into account that heat pumps will cost you at the very least 10,000 pounds Already, that's going to take quite a while to save you, over a hundred years, in fact. But obviously, the government is giving subsidies to you if you do get a heat pump installed, which saves you about 7,500. So let's assume you get the cheapest one, which 10,000 is actually quite a generous minimum. It is actually probably closer to 12,000. For sake of argument, we'll just say that it costs you 4,000. That's still going to take you over 23 years to actually make the savings, which obviously when it comes to the cost of living crisis, nobody's going to do that. The better thing to do is just for, to wait for the prices to come down because obviously as the technology gets better, it's going to get cheaper to actually install one, which is what most people want to do and is what apparently Rishi Sunak has now realised. So these are very good things. Naturally, however, if you're a car manufacturer, you are not happy with this news about the electric cars. As Ford leads furious business backlash to Sunak plan to row back on net zero pledges. And effectively, all that the Ford leader has to say is, if you are flip-flopping on policy that is affecting our industry, that is obviously going to cost us money, which is completely true. The Ford leaders are absolutely not saying that they are breaking any sort of net zero pledge or not really giving any sort of fig about the green agenda. They just know what their business plans are going to have to be when it comes to the next few years because they were putting a lot of money, 40 billion pounds in fact, into research and development of more efficient electric vehicles and now it turns out that they could probably have spread that over another five years. So as a business leader, you are obviously going to be furious at that. So Sunak also tweeted that we will still meet our international commitments and hit net zero by 2050, which I still think is a absolutely ludicrous target but as we can see this first step on a move away from the green agenda is the first step towards completely getting rid of that commitment. Our new approach will embrace with even greater enthusiasm the incredible opportunities of green industry. This will create hundreds of thousands of good well-paid jobs right across the country and the new approach includes lifting a ban on onshore wind which I am completely for. It is actually the most popular type of renewable energy when it comes to polling on the issue and I don't see why you should ban onshore wind as I don't see why you should ban fracking but obviously they've not said anything about fracking so we can only assume it is still banned. They're going to introduce new carbon capture storage which is something that I have been begging for for over a decade. It's very expensive but it is very effective at getting rid of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and obviously less greenhouse gas would be better in this time of general trends of global warming. Funding for size well C, yes, good. Nuclear power, good. New small new modular reactors, yes, again, more modular nuclear reactors, good. You want a few small ones dotted around the country so that they 
can power the national grid. And speeding up energy security projects, that's not very detailed, but having good secure energy projects that are national, they are good ideas. I have no problems with any of this. And then Rishi Sunak put out this other tweet. We will never impose unnecessary and heavy-handed measures on you, the British people. We will still meet our international commitments and hit net zero by 2050. So they are stopping heavy-handed measures including taxes on eating meat, new taxes to discourage flying, sorting your rubbish into seven different bins, compulsory car sharing and expensive insulation upgrades. Now the reason we need to go in a bit more detail on this one is because it is genuinely somewhat misleading. Though not to the point where all the leftists on Twitter are making a big song and dance about it, but it's still worth going through. So the first claim I'll go through is the claim that you will need seven bins and to sort your own rubbish out into these seven bins because it is the least egregious. So the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs later said it was never the case that seven bins would be needed by household and Tory MP Sir Simon Clark accused the PM of offering up strawmen which simply weren't policy. Well, I would say to DEFRA and Sir Simon Clark MP that they do not know their own government's legislation. As section 45A of the Environment Act 2021 states, this section applies in relation to arrangements made under section 451A for the English Waste Collection Authority to collect household waste unless there are arrangements in relation to which section 45AZA applies. The arrangements must meet the conditions in subsections 3 to 8, subject to any provision in regulations under section 45AZC. The first condition is that recyclable household waste must be collected separately from other household waste. The second condition is that recyclable household waste must be collected for recycling or composition. The third condition is that recyclable household waste in each recyclable waste stream must be collected separately, except so far as provided by subsection 6. So to make that absolutely clear, recyclable household waste needs to be separated into each of their streams and needs to be collected separately insofar as this next section, which says recyclable household waste in two or more recyclable waste streams may be collected together where it is not technically or economically practicable to collect recyclable household waste in those recyclable waste streams separately, or collecting recyclable household waste in these recyclable waste streams separately has no significant environmental benefits. In other words, all household waste needs to be collected separately in their individual streams unless it is not affordable or there is no environmental benefit to doing it. Well, there's always going to be an environmental benefit to doing it because it costs labor, transportation, and all that jazz to take in a, two separate streams, take them to a plant or a factory or warehouse, whatever, have people or robots in there to separate the streams and then transport them to their respective recycling centers. Recyclable household waste within subsection 10A to D may not be collected together with recyclable household waste within subsection 10E or F. That just means that food and garden waste has to be separate from the other four streams. And the fourth condition is that recyclable household waste, which is food waste, must be collected at least once a week. Household waste is recyclable household waste if it is within any of the recyclable waste streams and if it is of any description specified in regulations made by Secretary of State. So let's just make this absolutely clear. This whole section is about recyclable waste. So of course we just have general non-recyclable household waste. And then if it is economically and technically viable, every other one of these streams must be collected separately according to this act. So first we have glass, which is pretty self-explanatory. That is simply glass bottles, broken pieces of windows. At the moment, anything that is put into with the next two, which is metal, which includes tin cans, scrap metal, the like like that. And these two would also generally be put in with the next one, at least in councils that I live, which is plastic. Plastic bottles, plastic jugs, generally about 90% of what food and drink comes in. And then typically you would have a separate bin for the next one, which is paper and card. Again, quite self-explanatory. This is where 90% of the rubbish from your Amazon delivery goes. And then finally, we have the last two, which will always need to be separate, which is food waste. So that's your apple cores and anything that you can't eat because your eyes were bigger than your belly. And then finally, what typically goes in with food, but now that I've recently moved to Wales, they have their own separate bin for this. That is garden waste. Now again, from councils that I have lived in, you would typically have four or five bins. So it is not actually out of the question that 
you could actually have seven bins that you need to separate your waste into. And as we have seen from this very law, it says that these are the classifications that they need to be in if it is reasonable economically and technically to actually split them into these seven bins. So it is in fact law that you need to separate your waste into seven bins. And clearly it is a pledge that they are going to take this out of the law. They are going to amend the Environment Act you would hope at the very least. So again, to make it absolutely clear, yes, this seven bins claim is actually true. But after that fancy bit of editing, let's get back to the article. Meat and flight taxes are not conservative proposals, with the party instead clarifying there are recommendations from the Climate Change Committee, an independent body with no power to pass law. So Simon said a lot of straw men have been offered up, which simply weren't policy. Nobody serious in politics was talking about banning flying, taxing meat, etc. Yes, well, to be fair, you would have said five years ago that no one is seriously thinking about banning petrol and diesel cars, and then Boris Johnson comes out and does it anyway. So let's just be clear, people have actually seen crazy policies being put forward by Boris Johnson and practically everyone else in government. So I think it's actually at a point where we are so far into clown world that we actually need to point out that yes, we are not going to do clown world things. I don't think Sir Simon realises how crazy people see politicians these days. And another to be fair point is that, well, if they are serious policy recommendations from think tanks that do clearly have influence over the government, I think again it's actually fair to say we're not going to be implementing any of those proposals and making it absolutely clear. Anyway, the other points in that tweet are similar in nature to the ones I've just explained, so I'm not going to go into detail on it. It's clearly just a tweet to say, look, I know we're in clown decade, just to let you know, we are the ones that want to try and at least get us on the way out of clown decade. But a problem is, is that a lot of leftists on Twitter are out here claiming this is completely breaking election manifesto pledges and the Tories had lied to their voters. An example being Craig Bennett, who is CEO of the charity Wildlife Trust, who said it would seem that the purpose of environmental promises made by the Conservative governments is for them to be broken by Conservative governments. And then there was also Joe Foxstomper Morecambe, who was even claiming that the Tories were evil. Totally evil, this campaign. Not just that it's fundamentally dishonest to suggest we can hit our net zero targets without changing how we live. He's also deliberately undermining the efforts we all make to save the planet. Utterly contemptible. And this apparently involves four things that were apparently never policy, and the other which is recycling which barely even affects carbon emissions. So I want to make one thing absolutely clear and that is that nothing in the Conservative manifesto is even being broken by this. There are four mentions of net zero in the Conservative manifesto. The first one literally just states that reaching net zero by 2050 with investment in clean energy solutions and green infrastructure to reduce carbon emissions and pollution is one of the guarantees of the manifesto. And these changes are not breaking that promise. They are still investing in clean energy solutions and green infrastructure. That's what nuclear is, that's what onshore wind farms are, and these will reduce both carbon emissions and pollution. The next mention is that they will invest in nature to help them reach their net zero targets with £640 million new Nature for Climate Fund, building on our support for creating a great Northumberland forest, and they will reach an additional 7,000, oh no, 75,000 acres of trees a year by the end of the next parliament, as well as restoring our peatland. Now, given that absolutely nothing that Rishi Sunak has talked about has anything to do with that, we can just disregard it. The next mention is the oil and gas sector. The oil and gas industry employs almost 300,000 people, of whom four in ten work in Scotland. In other words, Scotland really does rely on oil and gas sector industry. We believe that the North Sea oil and gas industry has a long future ahead and know that the sector has a key role to play as we move to a net zero economy. In other words, that is not saying that they will ban any new oil and gas exploration and extraction licenses. They make no such sort of claim. In fact, all they're claiming here is that at the same time as trying to meet their net zero targets, they will continue to support North Sea oil and gas. We will support this transition in the next parliament with a transformation sector deal. So even a few weeks ago when Rishi Sunak promised 100 new oil and gas licenses in the North Sea, this is actually still keeping to the manifesto pledge. And then the final mention says, we will lead the global fight against climate change by delivering our world leading target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. 
And as advised by the Independent Committee on Climate Change, we have doubled international climate finance and we will use our position hosting the UN Climate Change Summit in Glasgow in 2020 to ask our global partners to match our ambition. And that's exactly what they did. So as you can see, there is nothing in the manifesto that is actually being broken by any of Rishi Sunak's promises. And even if it was, who really cares? Who voted for the Tories to reach net zero? The answer is nobody, because if you were a climate cultist, you are voting for anyone but the Tories. This is why it was the bottom of the list of guarantees, and this is why it's only got four mentions, because it's not primary conservative policy. If it's getting in the way of growing Britain's economy, making people richer, expanding businesses in the UK, of course they're gonna ditch it. That's their main promises. And that's exactly what Sunak is saying. It's hard to grow the economy because of all this green agenda. Business isn't booming partially because of this green agenda. People are staying poor because of this green agenda. So let's just do what we can to move away from it a bit, to help people actually be able to afford their energy bills, to afford food, to afford housing, because at the moment it's actually getting in the way of that. And anyway, if we look at pure data of all these stats that actually matter, according to The Spectator, which is very good for collecting its data, by the way, within the G20, we are one of the best for reducing our consumption of CO2 emissions. And as far as I'm aware, Rishi Sunak isn't actually doing anything to try and reduce that drop in CO2 emissions. We are doing very well to actually reduce the carbon emissions, which does actually matter. All Rishi Sunak is saying is that further things to try and drop it are pretty pointless because it's not really gonna help much and it's just costing everyone an arm and a leg. But now let's compare it to ourselves back at the height of the Industrial Revolution. Our current carbon emissions are at 1859 levels. They are lower than the miners' strike in the interwar periods. We are doing incredibly well for dropping our CO2 emissions. We are world leading on dropping our CO2 emissions. And none of this is good enough for the climate cultists. None of this is good enough for the media. None of this is good enough for anyone on the left wing of the Tory party or any of the other parties in Britain apart from obviously the right-wing ones that are basically seen nowhere in politics. So Rishi Sunak is absolutely correct to start taking a step away from the ludicrous policy that has been promised by the previous governments. And is this good enough for me? Of course it's not. He needs to go way further. He needs to completely cut out the net zero by 2050 pledge because it is practically impossible to do while at the same time lifting people up to get richer and to help the poor actually afford their bills but it is absolutely a step in the right direction, so I will give him props for that. They don't really help the poorest in society, a lot of people would argue. The poorest in society aren't fretting about when they're going to replace their car with an electric car because the poorest in society don't drive in this country. Yes, that is a Sky News interviewer trying to make the claim that the poorest in society don't drive, which is just such a ridiculous assertion. I'm not even going to bother getting the statistics to disprove it. Because it's just well known that pretty much every working man, every tradesman, anyone with a manual low paid job has to drive. Most of them, in fact, require them to have a driving license. And that's not just for proof of identity, that's so that you can, in fact, drive. I think the I think, I think society. I'm, I'm not I'm, worried about I'm, installing I'm a I'm so pump. sorry, but that is a ludicrous statement. If you step outside of London, come to my constituency, you will find the poorest in society drive because they live in a rural area. Yeah, I couldn't resist getting through this video without putting this clip of Kemi Bay and Nock here absolutely decimating this Sky News interviewer. Because as she says, she has to literally stop the interview to point out how stupid what this person from the media class has just said. I have recently moved to Wales. Wales is quite famous for being one of the poorer areas of the UK. Absolutely everyone here owns a car and drives because they have to. They can't get anywhere without a car. And despite the fact that cars are the main way to get around in Wales, the government has still put in a lot of policy to try and dissuade people from getting in cars, rather than doing what they should be doing, which is investing in better public utilities to get around. Better public transport, better trains, better bus lines, possibly even tram services in the larger cities. But Britain doesn't do that, because Britain is actually a poor country laughing as a rich one. Due to stupid economic policies that the left wing of the Tory party keep pushing, and of course, also partially due 
to this net zero insanity. That, These but, rules, no, 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 no. What you said is actually quite astonishing. It is not These, astonishing. It is a third astonishing. of the country doesn't what, drive. What, what, a third, third of the country doesn't people own cars. People who live in cities, people who live in cities, will be able to deal with this in a way that is quite different from people who live in towns and rural areas. We need to think about everybody, not just the metropolitan bubble. That... Just absolutely destroying her bigotry. The the absolute uninformed opinion of poor people don't drive is beyond me. The only poor people who live in London are foreign people who manage to get prime real estate in council flats and houses in places like Tower Hamlets. They obviously take public transport. When it comes to the rest of the country, I, even in the old place I lived, which was relatively close to Manchester, close enough to be on the tram lines, everyone still had a car. Everyone still drove. And that was even in the poorer regions near where I live, not just the rich areas. So this is indeed a completely ludicrous statement and it just shows the uninformed bigotry of the media class. They don't know anything about the country outside of London and Salford where they film everything. Live in yes, there in, are. In cities across the country, this is nothing to do with an urban yes, bubble yes, and metropolitan it, 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 London. I'm afraid, I'm I live afraid, in the countryside and just, I come from Newcastle. Well, I'm afraid that my constituents, I'm afraid bubble. that my constituents raise these concerns all the time and those who are least able to afford it are the ones who are making the most complaints. And we as a government are thinking about them. So I completely disagree with that. Just completely destroyed it. I really suggest you just watch that clip in full because it is fantastic you may be asking why didn't i just show it in full there well that's because i have to transform the content otherwise it is just stealing and i am no better than her sandpiker anyway to summarize what rishi sunak has done today is nothing short of good news and it is at least the first step on the way to getting us away from the green agenda madness you got to take these small wins where they come they are quite rare they are few and far between and i am indeed taking them where I can get them. Let's hope in the future we see a complete pushback on petrol and diesel vehicles as it is absolutely everyone's right that they should be able to purchase their motor vehicles in more or less any configuration that they would like. And let's hope we can actually get the energy companies to reinvest their earnings back into nuclear power and other reliable forms of electricity and energy. Anyway, that's everything I had for you today. So once again, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.